Hello, little fellow Whovians. Welcome to the Legend of the Traveling Tardis. My name is Christian Basil. Thank you for your patience for waiting for us. Uh, we've got a special guest today. Now, she is a very known well writer in Star Trek The Next Generation and uh, one of my personal favorites. Uh, uh, was it? Sequest. I know a lot of people don't go out there and saying Sequest a lot, but uh, she is a writer for both and a bunch of sci-fi. Uh, she's an author of sci-fi as well as... Um, you know what? I'm not going to say it. Let me introduce her to you. Everybody, this is... Hi, I'm Melinda Snodgrass. I'm a writer and a producer, and I also write novels in addition to screenplays, and I ride horses a bunch. Um, and this is The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS. So, well... My name is Christian Basil. Years ago, I had an idea. I got myself a TARDIS. Took it to new places, met a lot of new people, took some great pictures, and talked Doctor Who. From Krypton Radio and the creators of the Hanging With Web Show, this is the legend of the traveling TARDIS. Join me on my latest adventures and become part of the legend. But if you're watching or listening to this show, you know already. Welcome, folks, to the legend, the traveling TARDIS. Again, my name is Christian Basil, and here is our all-star panel for today. I got I got an interesting team today. I, that's a bad word. I have a wonderful team today, but they're very interesting. Trust me on this one. First of all, I'm going to introduce our guests before we get to our big, 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 big special guest over here. To my, I didn't want to say to my bottom. <laughs> stuck, my friend. That would have just been rich. For those of you who are not watching and listening to this on, on your on your, uh, you know what, Mackenzie Floor. <laughs> author of the right of wands welcome back Mackenzie. where have you been my love oh gosh i've been doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff i'm working on some secret projects for hollywood and broadway as well as the screenplay <laughs> of the right of wands that's it you're just gonna say i've been writing all this stuff for hollywood but there, <laughs> that's not gonna be it no, 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 no insiders no nothing you've been away for so long you're not even gonna tell us what you've been doing I can't yet. It's all under NDA. Otherwise, I would. Oh, but I <laughs> uh, Melinda, so you got, I got to work with here. <laughs> While I've been away from your show, I've been really doing some big, 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 big stuff over here. <laughs> Speaking of big, big stuff, I'm introducing our friends uh, from Type 40 podcast radio show. He's been here before. Mr. Dan Henley was with us with a bunch of other podcasters. How are you doing there, Dan? Yeah, I'm fantastic. Glad to be back. I'm Birmingham's King of the Geeks, of course, and I'm the host and producer of Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast on the Fandom Podcast Network. We put out episodes most weeks, and I think this is my third time with you, isn't it, Christian? I think it's say like the second or the third time there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. don't don't th yeah don't let I, people know. <laughs> it might be held against you or something. Yeah, some but th this time to keep me in line, you've brought a ringer in, haven't you? You brought. I did. My little sister here. Your little sister Sarah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I see. I'm going to razz her on live TV because I just Sarah just like disappeared from me, and I was just like, "Where'd you go? <laughs> I've been right here. I'm like, you didn't write me back." It wasn't She's just worse you. Than little sister. She's like my ex. <laughs> it's like, I just thought I'm not going to write you back. I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. Ghosted. Yeah, ghosted. 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 Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Speaking of which, Sarah, go ahead and introduce you to our friends over here. You're also on the Type 40 podcast. This yeah. is a lovely Sarah. I am indeed. Yes, I am. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm Dan Hadley's right hand woman. And you can find me on Type 40 and on Type Over 40 on YouTube. Oh. And yes, I'm here to keep an eye on all of you. <laughs> so what am I doing here? If you guys are keeping an eye on me, all the time. This is not, 
Nice there. <laughs> and I want to introduce our lovely guest uh, who is joining us for uh, her for the very first time, the lovely Melinda M. Snodgrass, science fiction writer for uh, novelization and television. You've seen her work, I believe. And let me get I want to make sure I get this right, Melinda. You've been for the writer for the second and third series of Star Trek Next Generation. Is that correct? And you've also written one of my favorite TV shows. It's my guilty pleasure. I don't care. Sequest uh, DSV. If I'm not mistaken, there you've been a writer for that. Yeah, I don't care what people say. I love Sequest. I love Sequest. I love I, I, I like when it was Sequest, when it was Roy Schneider, when all that was going on. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. it out there. But uh, you've also written for uh, The Outer Limits, Odyssey 5. Um, just for the folks who may not be familiar with you or your work, Melinda, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm a recovered lawyer. <laughs> I used to be. There what? Wait, wait, what was that? <laughs> yeah, I was an attorney, and uh -huh. um, mercifully, I got better. Um, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I, I had a best friend who was a novelist, and uh -huh. he introduced me to this group of writers. And it was Roger Zelazny and Fred Saberhagen, and I thought, these are the most fascinating people I've ever met in my life. Um, and I want to be with them. I don't want to be with lawyers anymore. <laughs> and I started writing in secret and, um, you know, eventually sold a book. And, you know, there's this sort of weird, you know, group of writers in New Mexico that developed. I mean, George R. R. Martin moved down here and George and I got to know each other. And, you know, there was Roger Zelazny, Walter John Williams. I mean, I, you know, it's like this huge clump of science fiction people. And I was flying once and a gentleman said to me, Oh, you're a writer, and you know, why, why are there so many writers in New Mexico? And I was like, well, you know, it's, it's inspiring, and there's three, you know, three different cultures, and you know, it feels. And he went, no, it's because it looks like the moon. <laughs> no, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. What? How is that a thing where there's like so many writers in New Mexico? I didn't know that was a thing. What? What? How does that lead? How's that put together? I just, I think part of it is. This is a beautiful, beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And I do actually think, for, and there's a huge colony of science fiction writers here. Uh, James S.A. Corey, the two writers who are that pseudonym. Right. Mexican, George. I mean, I think part of it honestly is that it's inspiringly beautiful, but I think the confluence of three cultures really makes it a place where you can see how that would work. And, and especially if you're writing about alien cultures, you know, mm -hmm. intersecting with human culture. And we're seeing that happen between the Hispanic, Native American, and Anglo, you know, all on display here. And right. we managed to get along pretty well. I mean, we're kind of, I feel like we sort of could be a model for, you know, a world in which it feels like diversity bothers people. And we kind of just do it naturally here. We're like, we all love green chili. And, you know, we're all like, okay, it's cool. Um, so we ended up with this huge colony here. And they inspired me and helped me. I mean... It was George who helped me get into Hollywood. Um, and I think that's one of the things I love about this profession is that everybody pays it forward. I mean, in this, nobody seems to think, oh, the pie is getting smaller if you get ahead. It's more, look, we're making a bigger pie, you know, let right. me help. And I find that just to be wonderfully inspiring. And um, so that's how I came to it. I came to it because these are interesting people and and I also hate occupying an office where somebody tells me I have to be there for eight hours a day. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, yeah. I got before I go into the show, I, I I can attest to that. Yeah, and then you work from home, so you're you're hooked up like Neo in the Matrix without yeah. the fluid, <laughs> and they just and you're just you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and it's just like, oh my god, if I got to go pee. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm fascinated, Melinda, by you. You're speaking there about the about the uh, cooperative thing between writers. How you uh, it's quite communal and supportive. But then when you started speaking, you mentioned how you started writing in secret, and that's such a romantic uh, vision that it conjures up in one's mind. So, what was that like for you? And how did you keep your stories secret? How long was it before you you shown them to anybody, either other writers or or your family or friends? I was only showing them to the friend who inspired me to get into writing. He said to me, "You know, I bet you could write." I, I I'm also I was also a singer. I I studied opera in Vienna before I came home and went to law school. Okay. Oh wow! So, you know, he said you're you're you have this artistic side in addition to the mm -hmm. sort of legal thing, and you know I think you'd be good at this. So I would 
I wanted to start writing, but I didn't, I wanted to see if I was any good <laughs> first before. <laughs> and, and so Vic and I would meet and I was still in a law office. So we would meet secretly and you know, we go and meet at like midnight. I don't know why it always had to be midnight, but it was midnight. We'd meet at this hamburger place called Pip's Big Boy. <laughs> <laughs> is this a meeting or a date? What is this? <laughs> And then by the burger joint at midnight. <laughs> There's some nefarious things going on. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> that I had written over the week, and I would show him, you know, give him my chapters, and he would read them, and he would critique them, and you know, because he was a published author at that point, and um, a lot of really interesting personalities wander through the Vips Big Boy at midnight. I want to promise you. So we would sort of watch this world go by. Um, and then when I so I sent I finished up this book and sent it out, and when it sold, then I was able. Then I felt comfortable telling mm -hmm. other people, like George <laughs> and yeah. Walter, and all the rest of the gang. Hey, you know, I, I've sold a book. And um, but I, I just, you know, you never want to be the, you know, what it's like. I don't want to be the. Yes, I'm a writer. Well, what have you yeah. sold? It's done. You know, you you feel awkward. Mm -hmm. you wanted to. Oh yeah. Yeah, I understand to some extent. I've worked as an illustrator in in publishing and particularly children's books and comic strips for several years now. And I was sort of calling myself an illustrator and a cartoonist for about two or three years before I'd actually sold anything, published anything. And you know, you do feel it's that imposter syndrome. And I was never as shy mm -hmm. as perhaps I should have been, to be truthful. <laughs> I won't lie to you, Linda. <laughs> but I do everything you've just spoken about. I can really, I can really relate to that. And and yeah, I mean, it is. It's it just conjures up all all these images. And one can only imagine the the sort of the joy of, of knowing that you've got something and delivering it to your friend. And, and uh, you know, with with and knowing that whatever you're going to get back, you can trust that you're going to get honest, constructive. Mm -hmm. Criticism, criticism, and they'll be happy for you and lift you up rather than try to hold you down. I think that's wonderful stuff. The creative community. Yeah. Now, I guess I want to go from the very beginning. I mean, where did you get the passion that started? What was the catalyst? What was the moment that you said, "This is what I'm going to be doing"? And when did it start moving into a sci-fi? Were you starting off in like general writing, or did you say, "No, this is this is where I'm going to be going"? And what was the moment that said, "Hey, this is it. This is my life now." Well, I, I've loved science fiction since I was a little kid. Um, I mean, my dad read to me 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea as uh -huh. a story, but he only read the cool, fun stuff, not all the fish stuff, you know. It was all <laughs> and, uh, and then the, he taught me to read before I went to school, and the very first book I read by myself was The Princess of Mars. Uh -huh. And so it's science fiction for me from the beginning. I mean, there was never, you know, any other uh, fiction that, in, excited me in this way and um, you know I've always wanted to go into space and you know see what's out there so that was that was easy um, I was reading all of this and then when I started to write it, it turned out my mother reminded me I had completely forgotten about this but I used to write plays for the neighborhood kids to perform mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I guess I did. Um, and so it was there and it just, you know, and when I realized that I was not going to have a career as a great opera star, um, because I'm not exactly built for it, um, I, I, I needed to feed that artistic side. And the law, while I, I'm fascinated by it and my specialty was constitutional law, I, I needed to feed my soul, you know, my spirit. And yeah writing and i've always told stories i'm an only child and i think only children you know we we make up companions and we make up stories mm -hmm. and adventures for ourselves mm -hmm. it became very easy to you know to just sort of move into it and once i realized i could sell and that i was actually pretty good at this um i then i was committed and also the thing i love about writing and i'm sure all the rest of you feel this too you never stop learning you never stop. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, so many jobs that people end up with, they start to feel just, it's, it's just grunt grind. You know, it becomes the same thing. With writing, that never Like a happens. lawyer job. Like a job at an office for eight hours mm -hmm. at the law firm. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't it mean. always feels, it's like, oh, I've learned something new. Oh, what if I try to adapt the fairy tale form? What does that look like? How? I mean, there's always this sense of, of exploration. 
with writing, and right. that makes me really happy. <laughs> So, Melinda, how did you move from uh, writing novels to doing um, screenplays? Was that like a conscious decision or did you just fall into it? Actually, Sarah, if you can do me one favor, I apologize. Let's hold that uh, Let's hold that question over for the commercial. Let's go to the break so we can pay some bills. When we return, we're going to continue our discussion with the lovely Melinda and Snodgrass. When we return, please continue to stay logged on, tune in, and become part of the Bit Legend. And of all the sponsors you're going to be seeing in just a moment. Bateman. What's the Bateman? A novel set in Florida, written by Florida author D.L. Havlin. Suspense, mystery, and murder. Evidence is in the bait. The Bateman is available at local bookstores and online. Jackie Sonnenberg's My Soul to Keep is a ghost story rooted in the realities of actual cults. When 13-year-old Sky Monroe arrives at her new boarding school, all she can think about is death and connecting with the afterlife. Soon she discovers her school's spirituality group, the Guardians of Light, and they have a secret. They can speak with the dead, and the organization is a cult. But this isn't Skye's only problem. The campus house where Sky resides is haunted, and even the ghosts have an agenda. They intend on getting the souls they want. Filled with mystery and intrigue plucked straight from the headlines, author Jackie Sonnenberg's research and attention to detail give this ghost story an even more eerie atmosphere. Find My Soul to Keep on Amazon.com today. Alien invaders enslave Earth. Unleashing hunters into the ruined wastes. One young survivor struggles to elude their monsters clinging to hope. When he's stolen off the planet by a sarcastic starship AI, they, they pit their, their uneasy alliance against a treacherous galaxy. galaxy. Explore a whole new verse of barbarism and betrayal. Wonder and adventure. In the Scion series. By Michael J. Allen. Beginning with book one, Scion Conquered Earth. Available in print, ebook, and audio on Amazon.com. <laughs> Deborah Parmley's Jenna's Christmas Wish. Santa, if there's one thing I want for Christmas more than anything, it's someone to spend Christmas with. Someone who really wants me to be there. Head to the mountains of East Tennessee with romance author Jenna Hart for a Christmas writer's workshop. Since her mother passed after a long illness, Jenna has had one wish. She doesn't want to spend Christmas alone. Meeting Niccolo Maldini cover model and actor could make more than Jenna's Christmas wish come true. Unless Ember, Niccolo's ex-girlfriend, does something crazy to stop them from being together. It's a mountain Christmas romance you won't want to miss in Deborah Parmley's Jenna's Christmas Wish. Now on Amazon.com. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Legend of the Traveling Tardis. My name is Christian Basil. I've got Mr. Dan Hadley. I've got Sarah, herself, starry-eyed girl from both from the Type 40 podcast. I have the lovely Mackenzie Floor, and I definitely have the Melinda M. Snodgrass, the very, very lovely there. And for those of you who are just joining us, welcome again. If you haven't, um, you can get, pick up some sponsorship. If you love this content, definitely give us a write-up over there at sage at thehangingwithshow.com or myself, Christian, at Hanging With Show. If you want to sponsor The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS, you can see that the audience has been growing uh, on the Facebook page, over 36,000 subscribers in the Facebook page alone there. And, and thousands of people watch every episode that we've been putting out out there. So if you want to get your stuff put out here, we're going to help you do that. Just write an email to either Sage at Hanging With, it's spelled H-A-N-G-I-N, with show.com, or myself, Christian, at The Hanging With Show. We'll tell you about all the special pricing that we're going to help you out out there because we help our sponsors and our sponsors help us out. So there you go. Uh, we're going to continue with our interview with Melinda M. Snodgrass. And I was rude. Give me it to Sarah right back. Uh, Sarah, go ahead and finish your question there. My apologies. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I just have a want... I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Christian. Oh, <work. laughs> um, yeah, I just wondered um, how, how it, the transition happened between writing novels to screenplays, because there's quite a, quite a gear shift there. And I wondered, you know, was it a conscious decision or did it, was it an accident? 
Okay, well, my dad always taught me that always take risks, and if an opportunity presents itself, always take it. Um, and in some ways, I think I was born to be a screenwriter because my novels tend to be very dialogue heavy. In fact, my, my critique group, my writers group would frequently say, great dialogue. Are they in a white room? <laughs> you know, where are your characters? <laughs> I'm like, I'll let somebody else decide that, you know. But um, so that was, it was a fairly easy transition. And it happened because my friend George had gone off to Hollywood to work on the new Twilight Zone and then to go work for Beauty and the Beast. And uh, we'd been doing this book series together called Wild Cards. And uh, my phone rang. It was George. And he said, uh, hey, Snod, which is his <laughs> name for me. That's very flattering. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think, you know, you grow up tall. And the last name is <laughs> But anyway, um, I, you know, he called. He said, I think you'd be good at the screenwriting thing. And you do strong characters and you do good dialogue. And, you know, you're, you're into that whole outlining thing, which... George does not do. And uh, that's a big deal in Hollywood. And he said, if you write a spec script, I'll show it to my, my agent. Um, and so two weeks later, I'd written a spec Star Trek script uh, that was The Measure of a Man. Um, oh. And uh, it was funny because George said to me, you will never, ever, ever, ever sell your spec script. OK, you know, you just don't do that. They're just a calling card. And if you if you, they like the script, they'll have you in, and you pitch new other episodes. <laughs> and, you know, actually, he gave me a piece of fabulous advice that I always pass on, which is I, I called him back and I said, Look, I have this idea for a script, and I think it's pretty good. <laughs> and, um, and, and I, if it's never going to sell, I hate to waste it, and maybe I should save it for my pitch. And George said to me, Never hoard your silver bullet. What? <laughs> lead with the very best thing you've got. Oh, you know, okay. never do the second best thing. Come with the best thing you've got. And he said, so write the thing you're most passionate about and that you most believe in. And they not only bought it, they ended up hiring me on the show. And so mm -hmm. that was how I launched my career. And then through the help of, you know, my the people I worked with, um, Ira Bear, who is fabulous, Rick Manning, Hans Beimler, they taught me the skills that I needed to be a successful Hollywood writer, how to break a story, how to work with, excuse me, how to work with a whiteboard, um, you know, just all of these things. And then I went on to work on a show called Reasonable Doubts, which was a lawyer show, lawyer cop show. And <laughs> my boss there, again, very generous. He would have me in the editing room with him and he would, you know, talk me through why he would edit a scene the way he did. Mm -hmm. Um, and we watched dailies and I would learn, you know, never write that line of dialogue for that particular actor again, you know, just things that happen. Um, and so, you know, as I moved from show to show, I got an education, but uh, it started by writing a spec script. And now if people are interested and want to get into business, the business has changed. You don't want to write a, a script for a show that exists. You want to write your own pilot or a movie because the agents and the producers and the showrunners want to see your vision rather than, you know, what you can do if you write an episode of, you know, MacGyver or something, you know, <laughs> or some show that is out there, Hawaii Five-O. Um, and so, which is actually, I think, very liberating for writers to get to do something your mm -hmm. passion. I'm just connecting all the dots now. Hear you talk, hearing you talk, Melinda, uh, Measure of a Man in particular. I haven't long watched that again myself beautiful the fact that you wrote it in a fortnight i'll try not to embarrass you too much as i said before but it, it's one of my very very favorites but of course it is a courtroom drama in a sense mm -hmm. it's its strength is in that dialogue that is what i recently played that episode for my son he wanted to sample some star trek from from the different shows and i picked out that episode for him and and the, the dialogue had us both sort of hanging on every word so hearing you talk that you that your dialogue was always your strength that you brought that knowledge of the uh your previous career to the to the script presumably and to the and to the uh your next career it's all starting to make make sense even more so now <laughs> didn't hurt that i had patrick and jonathan delivering those lines I don't suppose it would, no. <laughs> I had great actors, a wonderful director. I mean, everybody in that cast, I thought, was just superb. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, um, and again, what it 
sort of demonstrates is, is education is never wasted. I have used my law degree. I used it on Trek. It got me my job on Reasonable Doubts and on Profiler. Mm-hmm. Um, I, a novel that I have, you know, that's going to be out in very shortly, I think it's available in a bundle right now, is called uh, This Case is Going to Kill Me. It's about a woman lawyer in a vampire law firm in Manhattan. Um, and so, you know, I, I have used that legal education constantly. Um, and so it is, it, nothing is ever wasted. I mean, whatever it is you study, whatever your hobbies are, you're going to mine that at some point. Mm-hmm. I mean, all, everybody who's a writer knows that, knows that game. Yeah. 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 Every, Write what you know. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go ahead. But and at the same time, that's the worst advice anybody has ever given to me. <laughs> they write what you know. and that's why people are telling me, ask me that all the time. They ask me, like, what's one piece that you can tell us? I said, don't listen to the people that say, write what you know, because if I did that, the writer wands would never exist. <laughs> and I find it so interesting that a lot of the things that you've been talking about today are so similar to me. It, I have somebody who contacts me at like midnight and he's the one that I'm working with currently on multiple projects in Hollywood and Broadway. And he'll contact me at like 11 midnight and we just chat and get everything done then. And then it, it just, right now I'm working on a pilot. And like you said, it is just a, a way for you really to expand yourself as a writer. And I never really thought of myself. Everybody kept begging me. They're like, Mackenzie, you gotta do the you gotta do a pilot from the right away. You gotta I'm like, no, 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 no. I wanna be involved somehow, but I don't wanna do that. And I'm like, Yeah, with all this coronavirus and all everything, I'm like, this is the time to do it. <laughs> I'm <gonna> do it. <laughs> yes. Okay. For those of you who are just joining us, welcome again to The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS. We are doing a live chat as well there. We want to welcome Graham Krause. He says good evening, all. And Hi, Terry Graham. McIver, which show did you have the most freedom on working while working? I'm sorry, freedom on while working on a script? That's a good question. Um, probably Reasonable Doubts. Um, okay. I, partly because I was the only attorney on the writer's staff. <laughs> and um, it was a very small staff. There were only four of us. Um, and so, you know, we could we could really explore interesting approaches. I mean, Star Trek, we had, you know, the burden of, of the techno babble. Ugh, mm-hmm. Help me. And um, and so that was. You know, and, and also, you know, we had certain directives that our characters were perfect. They had no flaws, um, which is really tough to write drama when your people are perfect. Uh, and I think that's one reason that Measure worked so well is because I could actually have conflict. Um, and it was very tough to get conflict into a lot of, of the Star Trek scripts. Now, I, I got to ask, how did you get through the techno babble? It's bad enough the actors I hear a lot are trying to get through techno babble, but how did you do it? Did you come up with your own dialogue as well when writing the techno babble stuff? Or? Did, um, Mike Akuda and Stern and Rick Sternbach were became very close friends of mine, and they wrote most of the techno babble. I mean, right. a lot of the, uh, some of the other writers, like Michael Piller, our boss, he would literally have Jordy and then Perrin, tech, close Perrin, and then he would send it over to Akuta, <laughs> and they would write so it. was like techno babble. Um, star, 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 insert whatever you need here yeah. to make it make sense uh, there, yeah. You know, I tried. I mean, I, it was, it was a, I, I felt as a science fiction novelist, I felt a certain obligation to create tech. But you know, the problem is you then the emails start, yes, but in this other episode you said the blah blah and I'm like, it doesn't exist. It's made a plot. Okay. A technology was made a plot. Okay. Yeah. You know, just don't worry about it. Um Sarah but, control your cat. <laughs> <laughs> She's gate crushing. <laughs> that's the point you were supposed to say, no, that's not the cat, that's me in your tail. <laughs> I'm sorry, for those of you on the audio, yeah, if you're watching Sarah's camera, the cat's walking back and forth. So like, oh, <laughs> She wants a piece of the action. She wants a piece of the action. Speaking of the piece of the action, folks, we're going to be hitting up on a hard break. When we return, we're going to continue on questioning with Melinda Snodgrass and we return. And we continue with your questions and we have another person coming into the stream. <laughs> Miss Melanie D. When we return, please continue to log on, stay tuned in, and become part of the legend. Hi, I'm Claudia Christian with some exciting updates in the Sinclair Method world. 
Um, first of all, we launched our new coaching page. It's yoursinclairmethod.com. So you can go there and book a session with one of our fabulous coaches. You can also reach that page by visiting c3foundation.org. It's at the top of the landing page of the website. The second piece of news is Journeys is out. Woohoo! This book has been a long time in the making and it is available um, in Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your local bookstore, and there's a limited amount of signed copies at c3foundation.org. So get your copy of Journeys now and visit the coaching page for some wonderful support. If you're on the Sinclair Method, you can book a session with a variety of different coaches. Take care and be well. Best-selling and award-winning author of true crime and crime fiction, Yvonne Mason is back with a brand new book, The Pink Canary, a book that delves into the life of a drag queen and a marvelous whodunit. You can find this and all of Yvonne's other works on Amazon.com or find Yvonne Mason on Facebook and Twitter. He's going to kill me. Buy your copy of Pink Canary now. on Amazon.com. I coin from author Jeremy Mosby. It's an alternate reality and the leader of the planet I coin is none other than Benjamin Franklin. When corrupt officials threaten not only I coin but the earth as well, an unlikely chosen one, Jeremy, must face dark foes to save the earth and I coin alike. Author Jeremy Mosby takes readers on a superhero's adventure through this compelling and imaginative alternate universe. Get I coin on Amazon.com today. Experience Samara's adventure as she imagines the people around her change into friendly cartoon animals right before her eyes. Journey with her in this poetic tale, My Cartoon Imagination at School. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to The Legend of the Traveling Targets. My name is Christian Bays. I'm the host of this podcast, radio show, whatever they call it nowadays. I'm joined here with the lovely Dan Hadley from Type 40 podcast starry-eyed girl better known as sarah or sarah better known as starry-eyed girl the <laughs> artist ornaments also on the type 40 podcast and joining us i'm thank you so much for coming melanie melanie dean director of the show pieces of melee 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 malai malai but just go on on the instagram and what's that pieces of melee and mackenzie floor the right of wands Jojo, it's been a while and she's doing all this stuff. You didn't catch it, Melanie, but I go, Mackenzie, what are you doing? Just, well, I'm just writing scripts for Hollywood. And then I'm like, <laughs> okay. And that's all you're going to leave it. Don't even, don't even elaborate. I can't tell you people. No. It's like tell, it's, it's, you're getting Christmas presents, but not until December the 25th. And I'm not going to tell you what they are. You can't even shake them off. <laughs> you, keep him guessing, you keep him guessing, You keep him guessing. Yeah, that, that's the way to do it. I know. <laughs> Take sure. another six months off or something like that. And then yeah. anyway, we're back with the lovely Melinda M. Snodgrass. Hi, uh, and I believe, did one of us have a question or did I just lose my mind out there? No? Okay. I, I, mean, I think it would just say. <laughs> I have a million, but. You got a million? Oh, well, well <laughs> Melanie, you just came in here. Go for it. I know, I just yeah. showed up, so I showed up late. So, yes, I, <laughs> no, okay. I have a whole sticky note cube of uh, questions. But <laughs> and forgive me if I, because I am very, very much late. But, um. When you write, uh, especially for like Next Generation or just any anything where it's going to be performed um, by an actor, do you have a tendency of either having those character voices in your mind or like in that, that vocal pattern that we have in our internal voices as you're writing and you hear it? Or do you have a tendency of, of writing and then kind of performing it yourself to see how it flows off, off the tongue? Uh, excellent question. <laughs> um, I listened, when I knew I was going to write for Trek, I listened obsessively and I tried to get their patterns. And then I tried to, I, I always speak my dialogue out loud. And when I'm writing a novel, I say the dialogue out loud and especially when I'm doing a screenplay. Um, and I try very, very hard to mimic, even down to the accents, um, just to try to get the right rhythm. I mean, for me, because I was a singer and, and played piano, um, writing the music, and I know when a sentence or a dialogue is right because it rhythms right. I don't know how else to describe it. It, it you know, it just flows. And um, 
and and but I did make a real effort to you know whichever show I've been on I try to learn how to mimic I suppose we have to be minor birds mimic the actors that we work with mm -hmm. so listen closely and then I say I always say it out loud um, you know I think dialogue that you think sound is great and and also the other thing I've done with the screenplay that I really like I find really intent. Um, I'll bring together friends. A lot of my writer friends are also amateur actors. I don't know, we all have this need to be, you know, exhibitionists or something. And I bring them together, assign parts, and I would sit with a notebook and let them read the script and see how it flows and how it sounds. And you start to find out, oh, the scene is endless, you know. God, I need to God. Um, so that's also a really useful thing to do. Um, and you know, always have beta readers because they really help point out your your mistakes. So, um, yeah, so that's how I do it. Okay, Melinda, going back, you said that you were a big sci-fi geek girl. What was your geekdom? What is your geek cred at that time and and as of today? Because you're on a Doctor Who radio show, so so some of it's got to be part of the Doctor Who. Uh, oh, and, yeah. and who is your doctor? Well, my doctor was Tom Baker because he was the very first doctor I ever saw. I, I had never right. seen Doctor Who, and then I, they were carrying it on PBS, and I discovered it, and, and that was it. And the very first episode I saw was, uh, oh, Genesis of the Daleks, I think was the actor. Yes. And, oh, my God. I, you know, the man who stands there going, do I destroy an entire race? Because, you know, oh, I mean, I just loved it. But <laughs> the newer doctors, I, I have fallen in love with Tenet. Um, mm -hmm. he, I mean, all of them have been fabulous, and I'm I'm a, I'm a season behind um, with Jody because uh, I went to Roku and I can't. I'm gonna have to get Brit Box because I gotta. <laughs> get, I, gotta get um, I love them all, but Tenant was terrifying. I, <laughs> because he would go from happy, you know, da, da, and then he would look at you, yes. and you're like, okay, yeah. my heart has just frozen now. <laughs> Um, so, you know, he has, in fact, edged out Tom Baker as my dog. Really? Okay. Well, but, uh, yeah. but I, you know, I, I love the show. I mean, when I discovered Doctor Who, I mean, there was Trek, of course, because, you know, Star it was a spaceship. And, and I'm a little bit more of a science fiction girl than a fantasy girl. You uh -huh. know, I, I'm on a spaceship. Um, and I, I have to be honest, I, I break the hearts of Star Trek fans because they go, well, what do you love best? And I'm like, Star Wars. And they're like, <laughs> 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 I adore Star Wars. I would crawl with broken glass to work on any of the new Star Wars shows. I would. I, I have a Star Wars novel I'm desperate to write um, that grew out of watching Rebels. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I love, I love what we do. And we won, guys. I mean, we won. You know, I mean, the game, the video games I play, science fiction, fantasy games, you know, television, movies, um, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is going to end tomorrow night. Oh, I love that show. Yeah. I, know. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's been, I was starting to rewatch it because it's so good. Person of Interest, um, which is, I think, one of the finest television series ever made. And it oh, is. With, with Jim Caviezel? Yes. I never saw that. My it, brother, my brother said it was good. Yeah, okay. Brilliant. And um, Jonah Nolan, who created it, is just—I mean, he, said, he sets up things in season one that don't pay off until season three. And it is a science fiction show, but you have to be in there. You've got to wait about six episodes because at first, mm. okay, neutral, but it's not, and becomes more and more. And it's all about AI, and it is amazing. <laughs> and yeah. it, I'm gonna write it down so I don't forget again. <laughs> It's one of the few at Buffy. I mean, I own Buffy. I own oh, Buffy. I own very few. Yes. Yes. But there are some that I do, um, and person of interest. And yeah, I could just go on taking up all this because this is what I love. I mean, right. I, I had a law professor who kept saying, "Why do you like all that crud?" Um, Cre. Yes, and an unpleasant word. I will be polite because I don't know who's listening. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it. Before. He's heard it all before, Melinda. He's heard it all before. Okay. Well, <laughs> one never knows the age of who might be out there in the world, and you don't want to be. Okay. Well, I, I've heard it all, but I, uh, our audience 
who are maybe the younger type, <laughs> put in more more colorful adjectives <laughs> to, uh, to to cover up that there. Uh, yeah, it, it, this is the golden age of television too. I mean, we have so many choices. So. Oh, absolutely. Especially with all the streaming content, when you think about Netflix 10, 15 ish mm -hmm. years ago, where it was just, you know, put your DVD in the mail and we'll send you a new DVD. Mm -hmm. They weren't making original content. And now everybody is making original content. And not just, yeah, it's just, it, it's almost YouTube quality or what YouTube quality used to be. Even YouTube's putting things out that are just absolutely mm -hmm. phenomenal with the production value. Yeah. Exciting. So I have the power. I have the power of the TARDIS behind me, the shower curtain. That I have the power of the TARDIS to take you, Melinda, to any pro There's my TARDIS. <laughs> I'm coming to get it sometime this month, uh, Melanie. I'm coming, I promise you. Okay. Um, I have the power of the TARDIS, Melinda. I can take you to any of your favorite geekdoms, Doctor Who, Star Wars, Star Trek. I can take you back to any time, any place, anywhere, and put you in the rider's seat of that time frame, where exactly should I place you? Where would you go? Where would you want to be in the writer's chair with? Um, you know, it's 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 got to be uh, the Star Wars universe. Okay. Um, episodes four, you know, four, five, and six. Um, Star Wars, Return of the Jedi, <laughs> and our, our um, Empire Strikes Back, especially. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's just it's. I love a world in which there are so many different just i don't know how to describe it threads mm -hmm. running through it you know you've got pirates you've got smugglers you've got but you know how are people i'm always fascinated with how people make a buck i mean that's one of the things i, I, I want to know is like what does the minneapolis of star wars look like and nobody showed me that yet is there an amazon i mean because you either have coruscant you know which is like a giant planet that's in a city right or planets that are deserts and where people look like they're selling goods in the 12th century you know they're all like out there selling rats on are there no is there no amazon you know are there no where grocery stores what does this look like um and i just i would like to know that world and also honestly given the world we're all living in you know why do people accept an autocratic government you know why does that make you feel safe why would people you know and i you, you have to make those arguments you're coming off the clone wars there are billions of people dead you know oh my god he's promised peace and security and that everything's going to be okay mm -hmm. um and so what does that look like and and i just i find all those questions I, to be honest trek became a little too clean for me a little too neat um mm -hmm. Wanted, you know, I've always wanted to do a Star Trek series about the people sort of living in the cracks, the hairy muds of the universe. You're, oh, okay. Gotcha. You know, the, guys, the guys who are out there and the gals who are sitting out there going, oh no, it's Starfleet. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> and we never see them. It's always, you know, starships and it, it, it's, and it just feels. And, and I'm sorry, I've never been able to buy the fact they say there's no money in, the, in Star Trek. I'm like, you well, got, no, I mean, you know, the fun 23, something has to have value. Well, right? no, no, here's the funny part. What, what I thought was funny, and somebody had to explain this to me, is that if you notice in the original, um, one of the original movies, uh, in the last movie, what was it? The, the fi Not the Final Frontier, was uh, The Undiscovered Country. When uh, Scotty walks in, the first thing he says, Suits me. I just bought a boat, and I'm just like, wait a minute. How did you buy a boat? You don't even have money. What's going on out there? I forgot about that. Yeah. There are numerous yeah, lines like that. Like, you have no money. How did you buy a boat? So, um, speaking of buying a boat and making money, folks, we got to make money. So, we're going to be going to commercial break. When we return, we're going to be on our final segment with Melinda M. Snodgrass. Please, uh, please come back. And we've got your chats coming up there. When we return, please continue to stay logged on, tune in, and become part of the legend. You have more options than ever before when choosing a film, a television, or internet series, a book to curl up with, or even a radio show or podcast. Get to know the people who are creating for you. The Hangin' With Web Show. 
Hosted by award-winning author and journalist, G.W. Pometry is the Internet's fastest-growing web talk show series. The Hangin' With Web Show features professional, yet casual, in-depth interviews with creative arts and entertainment pros. Meet the people behind a digital revolution in creating more quality content than ever before in the history of media. Find the Hangin' With Web Show on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, or simply go to www.hanginwithshow.com. That's www.hanginwithshow.com. This is the legend of the Traveling Tardis. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Also, catch us on the HWWS Web TV YouTube channel. Subscribe today and become part of the legend. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Legend of the Traveling Tardis. My name is Christian Basil. For those of you just joining us on the live feed, I've got the folks from Type 40 Podcast, Dan Hadley, and the lovely Sarah Benanona, Starry-Eyed Girl, joining us also director Melanie Dean, Pieces of Melee, and Mackenzie Floor from the Right of Wands, who hasn't been here forever, so I'm just going to give her a hard time throughout the entire show. But we're going to continue <laughs> our final chapter with Melinda M. Snodgrass, author and sci-fi writer of some of the most incredible things. You know, I'm going to ask this question question of all the things that you've written Melinda what is the most what is the one piece of, of, of literature or, or, or writing that you are most proud of not not the best not necessarily the best but the one that you're most proud of for writing you know, did I just tell you to pick your favorite child is that what I just did? Um, no I mean I think it has to be measure of a man I mean okay you know I um, The beauty of science fiction for me and, and fantasy is we can talk about really difficult issues in a safe space. Because it's a little bit at arm's length, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I just, I feel like we could, I felt like I said something there. I mean, I, I've done good work on other things. Um, I've written good novels that I'm proud of. Um, and I, you know, I've, I, I wrote a thread for reasonable doubts that I was quite proud of, um, but I think it's got to be measure. You know, I, my friend Lynn Ween, um, wonderful comic book writer who created Wolverine and Swamp Thing, and mm -hmm. and and he said to me once, you know, I was feeling a little bit low because you know how Hollywood is. You know, it's it's what have you done for me lately? And you know, it was it's tough to get back in if you've been out for a while, and you know, it it can be a tough business. And I was feeling pretty low. And Lynn said to me, said, you know, I've been where you are. And I was feeling pretty bad. And then a friend said to me, whatever happens, Lynn, you created Wolverine and you created Swamp Thing. So even if, you know, you can always, and I think for me, I can always say, I wrote Measure of a Man and I had the good fortune to have wonderful people bring it to life in a really powerful way. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of it. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and would I, I would do it better now. I mean, cause it was, I was early in my career. Um, so there's some places where it drags and that I look at it. Oh, like we said, you know, Oh, please don't have them enter the room, you know, come into the middle of the seat, all the things you learn when you've done this for a while. But overall, yeah, I guess that's probably my, my favorite child. So. I'm so happy that you said that. Cause I absolutely love that story. I think Data is my favourite character from TNG. And what you did was, you know, you elevated him. Because I think in the first season, he was kind of like the comic relief a lot of the time. And, yeah. and that, you know, he, you, you gave him a soul in that in that story. And in um, Pen Pals as well. I really like that story as well. And his connection Magical. to the girl. Um, but yeah. But the most interesting character was the robot. Um, but, mm. but he was. He's a wonderful character and Brent brought him to life so so beautifully. But I think, I think one of the best and I think it, it contains one of the most best scenes in there where you know, <laughs> where Patrick is uh, 
one of the the greatest lines I've heard in Star Trek is like, "Well, we've been going out there just trying to discover life. Well, there it is, sitting right in front of us yes, this yes. whole time." And I, I you know, the, the, I I would actually say that that kind of was the precursor for now. I think you spawned on Star Trek Picard in the direction that they got into that. I think you have you were a testament to that. So yeah. I I think they borrowed. Show based on measure, you know, um, the the underlying foundation of it was was certainly measure, you know. <laughs> so. Right. Speaking of measure, because I'm a horrible segueist, we've still got the chats coming in there. We got Graham Krause that says, with COVID affecting production, that might be changing the opportunities in the process. So, have you had any challenges in now 2020 COVID world? Yeah, I mean, you know, the pilot I was supposed to be shooting this summer, uh, we're not shooting it. I mean, you know, I'm, oh. I'm doing boring things like making a lookbook and, you know, waiting to have the director put together a sizzle reel because I don't know how to do that. You know? mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we're just sort of waiting to when we can get We do have friends who are in Zoom rooms, um, and I would love to get into one. And my manager is following up on uh, some potential stuff, but you know, everything's pretty much on hold. So thank God I have these novels, you know, that right. I can go back to and I can, because I can't stop writing, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. like a, it's like a disease. You know? <laughs> <laughs> to tell That's not a bad disease to have. You're going to have oh. a disease. <laughs> so it's more of an addiction. It's like, a, yeah, it's, it's, it's an addictive yeah. kind of personality trait where you just yeah. can't stop. Yeah. Well, I'm glad when my horses come back here, come home, because um, it will get me away from the computer for a few hours mm -hmm. every day. You know, I can take a hike every day, which I also think writers tend to not, you know, move enough. So, you know, get up and go do something. But um, that time I spend there, always things cook in the back of my head. How, I'm sorry, I was just because you just mentioned horse. How has this affected um, the whole realm of uh, dressage right now? Because I know that's very competitive and that's, you know, that, that it's cycle, it's, Seasonal as well, and we can't can you? You can't compete, can you? Can you still train? We can train, um, you know, because social distance when you're sitting on a horse, you know, you're not exactly close to each other. Um, but we can't show. There are no horse shows, so you know, I we were getting ready to do a musical freestyle with my Grand Prix stallion, and um, you know, it just I, I need him with me, right. and I can't be. He was my horse is with me in California, and I can't really be there anymore. So I'm bringing him home, and uh, you know, I love them <clears throat> not necessarily because I have to compete, but because of just that. It's the closest thing to telepathy you'll ever experience is is riding on a very fine, you know, high level dressage horse. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, but no, everything's pretty much shut down. We can go to barns. You know, you just keep distance. You wear a mask. Mm -hmm. um, and no, they, it doesn't affect your oxygen. <laughs> you know, we can work out it. Why horses? We can wear a mask. You know? oh my God. Um, yeah, so our our busy. Hi, he's the old man. <laughs> Mackenzie, Sarah, go ahead. Bring your cats in. That's fine. <laughs> Speaking of cats, bad segue. Here we go. Carl Witzman, the next generation, hit me in the same way. We were talking about it was too antiseptic. It was too clean. That's why you like Star Wars. You like it down and dirty. You want you you want the, you want the boys to be messy and and doing the stuff mm -hmm. and fighting with lightsabers and a little grungy, a little. There you go, grunge. Leave <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it to the writers, Christian. I, 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 I always found it interesting how you know, like Measure of the Man was like basically like a courtroom drama in space, but yeah, I, I remember Gene Roddenberry saying that there weren't there weren't lawyers in the the twenty third century. We'd move beyond that. Is that true? He did say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, Gene, uh, Gene called me and um, he told me there were no lawyers in the 24th century. And then I said to him, well, then, Mr. Mr. Runberry, we don't have a script. <laughs> and uh, and El also said would be delighted to be taken apart. And I was like, we really don't have a script. Oh, um, my God. And, you know, he and I went round and round, and I said to him, I, and he would talk about criminal law. Well, you know, we know how to make people's minds right so they don't commit crimes. And I was like, that's all well and good, but there's still contracts and mm -hmm. divorce and child custody. I mean, you cannot, lawyers, better or worse, lawyers are 
embedded in society, and we need them. I mean, you know, they, the law is a foundation for some sort of structure for a society to function. Mm -hmm. It has to exist. I mean, treaties between alien races and, you know, the Federation, you have to negotiate these things and somebody has to do it. So yeah, we're, um, good, we're not that good yet. <laughs> CSI Federation. So, <laughs> so um, but we kind of got lucky because Jean, um, Gene was not around for six weeks on the show. Um, he'd had a health issue, and oh. they rushed the measure to the set, and they shot it with lawyers in it. <gasps> oh, no, I didn't know that. So, I didn't, oh, wow. Yeah. So by the time he comes back, it's like, sorry, it's already been committed to celluloid. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I found out from David Darrell that the same thing happened with The Trouble with Triples. Jane went, what, Jane really? Went, Are you serious? I'm wow. Serious panel with David. It, it was David, David, George, me, and David starts talking about how there wasn't a lot of humor in Trek, which I think was also a problem. I mean, you know, that's one reason I really enjoy the Orville. You know, some of the jokes don't work, but yeah. there's a sense of fun and, you know, they feel like people. And, yeah. and, and Jean went on vacation and they shot Trouble with Triples. <laughs> so, we got yeah. time for one more question here. Uh, this is from Maria. Do your scripts get altered much to get the end product? That's a good question. Uh, it's a very good question. I've been very, very fortunate. Um, I have not been rewritten um, on any of the shows. I mean, I get notes and then I make changes, um, but I haven't been re heavily rewritten. Mm -hmm. But it is more common that you do get, especially the showrunner is going to rewrite you. And um, and I, I tell people, if you can't stand to have your work touched, do not go to Hollywood, be a novelist. And otherwise understand that, you know, as a, as a producer said, writer producer said to me, write it, film it perfectly in your head, and then let it go, <laughs> you know, let it go. <laughs> because God only knows what will happen to it. Um, so you have to be prepared to be rewritten. Mm -hmm. but, um, I have been fortunate in that I haven't been. Um, yeah. So yeah, that that's been nice, you know, to um, to avoid that. The showrunner on this pilot, and it becomes a show. I want to try to be very respectful to the writers I hire, and try not to you know come in and run it through my virtual typewriter all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I just think that's that's the novelist in me still wanting to be fair. We've had such a great time with you, but we're coming to the final moments of the show, which is the time that we always dread because there's actually about, about 100 questions we've got. But Melinda, do you have any upcoming projects that you want to let people know that you want to let our audience know there? The major thing right now is I have a novel that is going to be available very soon on Amazon, a lot of other platforms called This Case Is Gonna Kill Me. <laughs> and that's the one about the woman lawyer, uh, young human woman lawyer in a vampire law firm in Manhattan. Um, it's the first book in the series, and uh, I have a space opera, a big space opera series, and that first book should also be available fairly soon. It's called The High Ground. So those are the two things right now that I've got. So, and the, we have to talk more. <laughs> I want to talk more with all of you. So. No, I know. Uh, well, well, actually, if you'd like, and uh, we'll hold this over, we actually have an after party, which means we're going to be ending the recording of this episode for our folks who are listening on the radio show. But if people want to stay and we keep talking, you're more than welcome to stay for another half hour. Um, folks, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you for joining us. I want to, uh, I want to thank my uh, guests, Dan and Star Eyed Girl, the lovely Sarah. Thanks for joining uh, us. Uh, tell, tell, yeah, tell Thank folks you. where they can reach on, the, on the Type 40. Please tell them where they can reach on Type 40. Oh, well, you can find Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast. Most weeks, new episodes drop on the Fandom Podcast Network. We're over on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Podbean, the Podbean app. Uh, where, where else are we? Tune in. We're over on there. We're streaming on iHeartRadio, absolutely everywhere. And as from this week... We're also on YouTube on the mm -hmm. Fandom Podcast Network's own channel. But that's what I, I produce and host that along with Sarah and a couple of my other friends. Uh, but we've also got a YouTube channel ourselves called The Space Book where we're putting out stuff about Doctor Who and mm -hmm. Star Trek mm -hmm. and James Bond and whatever else comes to mind. It's all, all happening over on YouTube. So look for The Space Book and, yeah, look for Type 40, please. 
I'd say folks follow Mackenzie Floor, but she'll be back in like six months for another episode out there. Check out her books <laughs> in the Rite of Wands. Check out Melanie's stuff, Peace and Melee on the Instagram. And again, we want to thank our special guest, Melinda M. Snodgrass. For those of you who want to stick around, we're, we're going to go into our after party in just a moment. We want to thank you all for supporting us. 36,000 Facebook subscribers and growing like mad, like wildfire. Thank you again, folks. Please continue to stay logged on, tune in, stay safe, and always become part of the legend. And now we're in the after broadcast. So everybody, that was the end of the audio show. But anybody who wants to chat and stick around, by all means, go ahead there. Yeah, cool. I know it's your eyes lit up, Melinda, at the James Bond. So go, who's your favorite Bond? Daniel Craig. Yeah. Daniel Craig. I, I, you know, I've been a Bond. Well, I'd like to say I'm a Bond girl, but I'm not pretty enough to be a Bond girl. But um, yeah, uh, yeah, I've loved Bond. I, I love Bond. I was so disappointed in the pandemic delayed because I was really hoping this last. Mm. Oh, no. Tell me about it. Oh, I'm like, oh, no, I'm looking forward to it because uh, it's got to be better than whatever Spectre. <laughs> Please let it be better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm in the minority because I was actually in another show where they were talking about who's your favorite Bond, and I was like, I actually switched, which I never mm -hmm. thought I'd do, but I think I'm a little biased because he was also Rassilon. I went from Sean Connery to Timothy <laughs> Oh, I switch all the time. But I, yeah, 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 I, was just like, I, I was just like, I think I'm being biased out there. Oh, Carl, are you still here? That was a great idea to have friends read out the dialogue. I'll try to have the Yes, Carl. Um, Carl's with a bunch of team uh, with uh, Brian K. Morris. He does a uh, show on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays called Nevermind the Furthermore. And his show is is very unique in that it is not only wonderful because he talks to a bunch of authors, but they all promote each other on the same show. They're literally on top of each other. They all merge together. If they get like, uh, um, I'm writing a comic and somebody happens to do illustrations, they can work together. He actually, it, it's almost like a, a podcast network, but it's Brian and he's wearing the fez and he's also wearing the bow tie. So he is a big Doctor <laughs> fan. But yeah. it, it's wonderful to watch him, and then usually it's just uh, half of us flirting with each other. But that's that was the case there. Well, Shameful. You, you had some it's true. It's true. <laughs> I've been at a convention with Brian, so that's how I met him. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no shame with Brian. Mackenzie, it sounds like you are adapting a novel you wrote as a screenplay, correct? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like you also, where by dialogue is my king of the crop so it's it's very interesting you have a very we have very similar paths there <laughs> well we're both gingers too so you know yes <laughs> and gingers are cool <laughs> and this show just got dangerous <laughs> <laughs> which i actually got a follow-up question to what melanie was asking about when it came to mimicking because this is one of the things that i'm struggling with right now in my script is I'm actually writing my main character for Matt Smith, who played the 11th Doctor, and I use his characteristics, which one of his infamous characteristics is flapping hands. So my coach had told me, well, write some of his characteristics. And I'm like, okay, no problem. So I start doing it. She comes back. She goes, is the flapping hands really necessary? <laughs> <laughs> he's going to do it whether he's going to do it whether you put it in or not, isn't he, Mackenzie? That's yeah, thing. he's going to do it regardless. Yeah, I don't even have to write anything. We're like, talk with your hands. No, he's going to do it. <laughs> in fact, the one scene I was trying to write out, I'm like, I know exactly how you probably would do this dialogue, but like, I don't know how I do this because I know exactly in the beats and the, how you described it, like beats. I'm like, that's exactly what it is. It's like an orchestra. <laughs> you know, the, the ellipses. Beat, Corinne beat Corinne, or God help us, the ellipses dot dot dot, you know, can work for you. I mean, I think <laughs> actors sort of figure out what they're going to stick in there if you give them that. You know, I mean, that's the thing. You're always, you, you know, you're working with so many different people. It's like you don't want to offend the actor by telling them how to play a moment, mm -hmm. and you want to offend the director by, or the fight coordinator by describing the whole fight. and. So it's this, you know, balancing act where you're trying not to be too pushy, but also try to get your vision across. So, you know. Yeah. 
had a friend that had that that um that, that, that kind of arresting moment when he was because he's very much in in the novelization world and he started trying to transition into doing script writing and it was just like independent script writing and we would go through and look at it um from i mean this is like horror movies so this was just very independent horror movie so everybody's looking at the page and everyone's wearing 18 hats and the bad things we're looking at the at scripts that with his and we're like you you know it, it was too descriptive and we'd have to tell him, no you we're just looking for the dialogue for it you can't do anything else and he's like well i want this I'm like no that's the dp well how about this that's the director oh, well this that's the actor it's like it's a huge team thing it's like you literally are writing the words and then a little bit of are we inside are we outside and he just was like, I can't do this. I'm no done. I'm like, okay, <laughs> we'll put you, you can be the line producer on this. Let's do that that way. He's like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a different world because I, people had always asked me to do something in regards to the script of the writer was. And they were like, well, why don't you write it? And I'm like, why should I do it? I mean, I, I, I've never written a script before. So why should I? But then they're like, well, you know, the character's best. And then a friend of mine who's a producer in Hollywood, he's like, you know, you should do the pilot. You should start writing the pilot. And I know this person who knows this person and knows this person. So I'm like, okay, let's let's start somewhere. <laughs> and I, the one thing that always bothered me about Harry Potter, and I find this really a criticism for most books that go to film, is that there's so much that has to be cut out. And a lot of times you get some of that story, the important portions of the story gets lost. So for me, I'm like, well, this is going to, if there is any cuts done, I want to make sure that my series makes sense. Well, go figure. So far, my first part of it up to by Act One is all brand new material. So here I am doing that. <laughs> yeah, in the pilot that I, I wrote, the spec pilot, I have a. Comp it, it's based on a novel uh, that I wrote, and um, you know, I went through with a hatchet and just threw out tons of stuff that won't work. But I wrote a whole new opening, and I like the opening so much better that I'm going to change the novel to match the screenplay because I think it's a better. I think it's a better opening. Um, before uh, I reissue this book, so I'm gonna just add this in. Carl Witzman says, uh, "Gingers are cool," and he goes, "But I'll behave." <laughs> <laughs> when he puts "I'll behave," that means there's something coming up right behind it, and I should probably censor that next book. <laughs> <laughs> My first paid writing gigs were for newspapers and magazines, so I just expected everything to be changed. Maybe I should try scripts. Ha ha. Okay. <laughs> I had to make sure there were two yeah, laws. I'm sure that has, you know, to be rewritten. <laughs> I made, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Melinda, I made a mistake a long time ago. I wrote a play um, as, uh, and I wanted to see if you had any challenges with something that you have made written, the audience kind of taking tasks to it. I wrote a play a long time ago and I took a chance. <clears throat> the, the idea behind it was, what if the National Choir existed during biblical times? And it morphed into a play where it was 30 minutes prior to the birth of Jesus. The angels are about to go over and head over to the, uh, to, to, to the nativity. And they're trying to recruit uh, the shepherds. And it turns out they're two road masons and they're just dumb as rocks. And he, they, they got 30 minutes to get this all assembled. It's like, wait a minute, we, we got him coming. You need to come. And they're going like, they're trying to explain it to it to them what they're doing and one of the things they accidentally blurt out is he who was born of the virgin mary and <laughs> the, the, the romances are going like what, do, what are you talking about the you know it, it was a comedy scene but i made a big mistake of doing this in east florida where the evangelicals live and i was torn to shreds oh god so, I was thinking matter. I'm like, You're facing this. a funny thing on 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 the bible no yeah, well, it, it, was, the audience. it was a good take. I, it was no different than when um, Red Dwarf does that little bit, the missing page from the Bible that came came up there. <laughs> yes, that was good. Goes, oh, we found the lost page from the Bible and it says these uh, these characters are fictitious and not to be taken seriously. <laughs> Yeah, any resemblance to anybody living or dead is purely coincidental. Yeah. So have you ever been challenged by an audience member saying like, "Why did you write that? Why did you do that? Where did you go?" Or has that ever even happened? Not, not to you know, not really. Um, yeah, <laughs> looking back over the career, you know, it, it's personally, I love your play. I would love to see that. That sounds hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I've had to bury that thing. <laughs> you can't see the light of day. It's, it was like 20 years ago, but it was just like, oh, God, if it would come out now, I'd be killed. They would, they would build a crossing crew or so far. <laughs> you know, I... I guess maybe that, that Sequest episode where I wrote a ghost story because I didn't know what else to do with Sequest. You know, and there were people going, why are you doing a ghost story on this show about science? But, you know, I was like, because it felt real romantic. You know, that, that, um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess one important safety tip is I, I don't read reviews, good or bad. I try to just... Mm -hmm. um, if they're good, you get a swelled head, and if they're bad, there's nothing you can't change it. You know, it's already right. been, it's already been published, and so I'm like, eh, no, no, I'm not gonna go there. No, I go Al Capone. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his house burned down. <laughs> Everybody's gonna be down. <laughs> I can't. Re I, yeah, I can't review reviews on this show for crying out loud. If I get it wrong, I'm just like, what? What, what show did you watch? What were you thinking? I was just like, yeah, I, I see people. Um, I, I ended up on another podcast, and uh, this guy has like, t like he's in like the six figures of YouTube, and I ended up on the show, and I was reading the comments uh, uh, from people who were talking about me, and a lot of them were positive. But there were a few that were like. Who's this idiot? What's he talking about? Yeah, I, I get those as well. When I, I, yeah, yeah, I've had those, mate. Don't worry. <laughs> I've gotten them too as as the author as well. And in fact, I've gotten two pretty good ones that were real doozies. One was actually a a troll that wrote an encrypted message to Matt that basically said that he had to hire a somebody who actually knew how to write and write fantasy. I'm like. Well, number one, he doesn't, at this time, he didn't know about the book. So I'm like, well, number one, he has no idea. So why are you writing it about him? And then I go on this talk show that's out in the UK and I start joking about it. That same night, it disappeared. So I was like, oh, okay, my troll was, must have been listening to the show. There's no coincidence <laughs> that. <laughs> but I ended up screenshotting it because it was just so like ridiculous of how it was said i'm like i just want this ridiculous comment so someday i can look back at this and be like well <laughs> well melinda you said you were in question how many horses do you have i have two, <laughs> yeah, two. And you said that was the magical part when you were talking about during the show was that there was a, a, a telepathy mm -hmm. How do you describe that? Because I, I meant sometimes I think uh, I, I just recently lost my dog Bailey, like last year. I lost my dad and my dog, my dog in the same year. But there was just you mentioned telepathy, and that just kind of there was like a it got into my head. It was just like yeah, I remember we have three dogs, and Bailey seemed to be the one that I he, he related to me. He would always come into the room when I was working. He would always sit down. If I went to the bathroom, he was sitting in the toilet, maybe because my feet were warm. But he was, you know, he there just seemed to be like an unwritten uh, thought process between us. He kind of like knew what he was doing. It was just like basically give me the stare, like feed me, <laughs> you know, just. <laughs> but tell us a little bit. Tell me about what you, your telepathy. What, what, how do you feel? Does that make sense, or is this? Yeah, like... no, the routines have to be memorized, don't they? By by both you and the horse. Really? Yeah. Well, you hope the horse doesn't memorize it because, oh. yeah, you really don't want them just. I got this, mom. I got this. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're not going to be off yet. No. <laughs> so I'm going to the bathroom. You can't follow me. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in fact, when I'm practicing tests, I often ride them out of order. So oh. learn them <laughs> or figure them all out. Um, but you have to you have to memorize the upper level test. You can have a reader for lower level, but when you're doing FEI, you have to memorize them. But um, you know, I think it's I know intellectually that the horses are feeling minute changes in muscles, you know, and the muscles of my leg, or you know, how my hand is handling the reins. But it feels like telepathy. It feels like if I just think halt and then they stop you know and it's just i mean it's 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 amazing <laughs> i i mean but dressage is definitely the sport for people with ocd you know <laughs> like enter at a x halt salute you know and, and it's all, everything happening at these precise moments mm -hmm. um, and so you know it is a little bit weird that way <laughs> but i i love it i mean i jumped when i was younger and then one day i went you know 
you rarely hear about dressage riders getting killed. <laughs> and so I think that's, that's true. true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so wait a minute. That's true. You don't want to be a statistic. <laughs> yeah. And I broken I had a horse slip in the mud and fall on me and crush my ankle and oh, oh no. no. Oh, <laughs> God. It's a dangerous sport, but it's a really wonderful sport. So <laughs> Uh, it's yeah. one that I, I thoroughly enjoy watching where it's like, it's almost like the Olympics where I, I don't avidly follow it, but if at the second it's on and I know it's going to be on for a while, then next thing you know, it's like, I like to think that I'm like some expert on Twitter saying, Oh my God, could you believe that this, 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 this is, you know, just like how everybody else kind of gets into things like figure skating, like in the Olympics, nobody cares about it. But when it's on, everybody knows exactly how something's supposed to be, be performed. Oh, I, my Facebook, well, <laughs> my Facebook people, periodically I'll come from a lesson and it will have been amazing. And I'll go into this thing about, yes, I'm feeling that, you know, the straightness of the, when I'm trying to do tempi changes and I realized today that I needed to da 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 and I have to give an inside ring half all followed by a, you know, and I go, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then people come back and go, okay, we have no idea what you just said, but you're obviously this, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and I'm like, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. And now I've taken to going horse neep coming, you know, or opera neep coming. You know, that's another one. Um, <laughs> would you all like to hear Kathleen Battle sing this marvelous thing? <laughs> and most of them are going, thank you, no. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a hard pass for me. <laughs> well, I'll, throw this, I'll throw this question out there since it, it seems to be, we just had an episode on, um, what was this? Do we do this on Saturday? God, I don't remember what, the, what or Sunday. The Christopher Eccleston. No, no Monday. Finish. Monday. Oh, Monday? Was it? It was yesterday, honey. <laughs> what is it? No, wait. Hold on. Oh, Sunday. Yeah. It was Sunday. Yeah. Like two or three. I know there was a day in between. I was just like podcasting a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's this time now that the days are just rolling into one and time yeah. just doesn't make any sense anymore. Oh I, yeah, totally. Because it's like I had to write my coach. I'm like I'm sorry, my act one is not finished yet. I have, I'm have, i behind. She's like, it's okay because I'm behind too. And I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> I swear, I swear, I know that I, I know I'm just fooling myself, but I swear that time, yeah, as you mentioned, Sarah, time has no limit here, but I don't go walk outside. It's 9 p.m. and the sun's still out. I'm like, the hell? We're <laughs> 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 going like, just for Chris, you, you remember that cartoon when Donald Duck's walking through the, uh, the desert and the sun's just beaming up on him and he's walking across. That's me with the sun. It's just like, I'm still here. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'm just going to follow you, sir. <laughs> uh, sadly, Christian, the sun has gone in here. So I hate to break <laughs> right yeah, the yeah, party. Yeah, I'm going to have okay, to go no, as well. Yeah, it's, it's getting late. Really very late in the <laughs> UK. We both need our beauty sleep, don't we, sir? We do. We well, do. not fair. You do definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, you wanted me on the show, right? You want to? You, you, will this time work next week or? Uh, no, because we're not recording at the moment. We've just finished. We've just finished season two. Oh, well. but, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I'd love to have you back. Back in the autumn when we come back, we're back for season mm -hmm. three. Yes. Yes, all the letters that didn't do any good, we are back. And <laughs> yes, we're going to invite Christian on and have another chat and we'll mess around a little bit and we'll drive you mad for yeah. an hour or so. But thank you so much for the invitation, Christian. It's lovely to meet you, yeah, Mackenzie thank you. and Melanie, wasn't it? And uh, it, well, everybody really. And Melinda, I I've loved your work for years and years. It's mm -hmm. such a thrill to meet you and speak to you and to hear some about your story, your sort of journey through this career. So yeah, it's, it's been delightful. Thank you so much. As, yeah, I've been, I was fangirling when Christian, you know, suggested it. I'm like, yeah, I get to talk to Melinda. Well, thank you. You guys, I know it's late there, and thank you. It was lovely meeting you, and I hope we get to chat again. It's just so wonderful. It feels so isolated. Yeah, it'll be lovely. Yeah, you, you, all of you are welcome. It's lovely to meet you the and Melanie and Mackenzie as well. Yeah, Sarah, yeah, no, I you should you. I love to go on your show sometime. Too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, my well, email, Sarah, no excuse to go. I will. I will. Next, <laughs> next week, next week, we're getting together with Robert Meyer Burnett, who you may know. You know, he's mm -hmm. he was on our show a few weeks ago. We we had so much, so much fun, and to be honest, we've We've got some very incriminating photographs, so he is coming back. <laughs> 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 that's, 
that's uh, next week or the week after on the Spacebook channel. But yeah, it's lo lovely to have met you all. Thank you so much for, for spending time with us. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers, Christian. Night, night. Bye, Christian. Bye, guys. All right. Well, uh, today is the 341st of November. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever November is. Um, At any um, point when you're, when you're to the, the books drop on Amazon, and I, I hope possibly even Audible, uh, please let us know or, you know, whatever channel it, to get the information to us so that we can make sure that we put it on our Facebook page or at least on the next show to say, hey, who knew new when we have our little news segments, we can say, hey, remember the episode where we, you know, we were talking to Melinda? Here's the, here's the links for those books and that way we can get them out there for you. Well, yeah. the, Melinda, this episode, make, uh, we usually spread them out when we do the audios because once we do the videos, we kind of want to give it some time so that it, there's another wave so that we've done this episode and then we'll have the audio episode come out. So there's another crest of the way, but in the audio, we actually put all the links to your information. Yes. So I got contact with Lexi, but just in case I'm going to make sure he gets all the information sent to me. So we can make sure I'm getting the episode and I'll send the information yes. back to him. Yes. So much fun. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I definitely will. The books are available audio already. You know, those, those are still, those contracts still exist. It's the, Ebooks and and print on demand that for that Alexi is helping me with and, and okay. it, he's wonderful and I can't say enough good about the what he's done for me. So, and speaking of, I should probably I actually have to get back to work. Oh. On that. <laughs> just, just, just make sure he gets me those links so I can make sure that we can post them um, periodically throughout the traveling Tardis. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's really fun and uh, I really appreciate it. So um, we appreciate you coming on. Yeah, it was lovely to be all chat with you tonight. Yeah, let, let's hope for let's hope for a vaccine so we can all get back yeah. to this. You know, yeah, yeah. Back yeah. To absolutely. Okay, bye. 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 Thank bye. you again. Thank you. Bye. Here we are. Just a three. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Just oh. a three. I wish I had my phone because I had my phone on silent and it was face down. And then also I flip it over. Fifteen minutes later, I'm like, wait, what? You want me to jump on? Wait, I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Message my husband. I'm going in there. <laughs> <laughs> everything frantically Josh on. Going yeah, Brian just said uh, an a wall there. <laughs> oh, second. Let me go ahead and end the broadcast there, folks. Have a great time. Be safe out there. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know what? I think we'll take a week off. What? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Oh, man. What? 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 Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. We, we have. <laughs> I was on, I was on kill me. We have the we had the recording on Sunday. We have the recording today, and then we're also doing a uh, a Harley Con this weekend. So, yeah. like, and Har and and I talked to uh, uh, Amelia, and she said she'd be kind enough we can get a recording so we can put that as an audio show or use it as a future episode. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, you gotta, this Saturday, if you're still watching Saturday, us right now. 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if you're catching us for our friends in the UK, that's 6.30 p.m. on the 5th we, of August. And some of us will hopefully be popping in and out helping moderate some of the panels. I'm actually looking through the list to help because I know that we, we're missing some moderators. So you might see us in other little spots. Gotcha. Folks, uh, we're just going to end the broadcast. Yes. You, you stick around for just a second. But thank you, folks. Thank you for joining us. We'll catch you next time with The Legend of the Traveling Tardis. Mm -hmm.